Okay, good morning. Uh, the introduction explained a lot. Uh, my name is Christopher Nesbitt. I live in Belize. Um, we're going to be talking today about uh, damaged landscapes, which... Yeah, you can do that as you see it. Thank you. Um, it, uh, we're going to be talking about damaged landscapes, which abound in, in the lowland humid tropics. And much of what I'm talking about will apply to, to the lowland humid tropics, but some of the thinking behind it can apply elsewhere. Um, Belize is in Central America. We're one of the only English-speaking countries in, in, the, uh, in the South, uh, the American, South America and Central America, the other one being Guyana. Uh, we are a former English colony. We still have the queen on our money. We have a governor general. We feel a real kinship to England, so it's very nice to be here. Uh, uh, I, I run a small NGO called Maya Mountain Research Farm. Uh, we are located in the foothills of the southern Maya Mountains. Um, I originally bought the farm in 1988. It was uh, kind of an immigration dodge. I wanted to move to Belize, and the easiest way to move to Belize was to buy a piece of land and declare yourself a farmer. Uh, my father gave me a book called Living the Good Life when I was about 10 uh, by Helen and Scott Nearing, and I read it, and I think my father rused the day he gave that to me because it, I, the agricultural lifestyle appealed to me uh, from when I was small. Uh, we are a registered non-governmental organization. Uh, uh, we have 70 acres of land, and about 26 acres of that land is under some form of uh, conservation, and we have 500 species. Um, uh, you can see here, this is a Google map uh, image of where we are. We, we are in uh, kind of the edge of primal rainforest going, extending north for many, many, many miles. And so we occupy uh, a very strategic uh, place. There's a laser thing. Uh, oh, oh, never mind. I, I'll just point. Um, uh, you can see a little bit further up from where it says Maya Mountain Research Farm, the river winds around. That's the source of the river for much of the year. So we occupy a very strategic place, an important place in the landscape, because all of the water that comes out of the ground comes out of the ground close to where we are. So we take our stewardship of where we are very seriously. We live in an area that's actually very beautiful. Uh, it's very biologically important. Uh, the only way in and out is by canoe. We have no roads. And uh, right here you can see a, what a traffic jam uh, in San Pedro, Colombia looks like. Uh, some days coming up the river is magical. It's just beautiful. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. It's as close as I can get to meditation. Uh, pooling is very peaceful. Um, other days, not so much. Uh, this was the biggest flood on record, which uh, in the 20, it'll be 27 years in December that I've lived there. Um, and uh, we had the biggest flood ever, uh, significantly about four or five feet above any other flood that I've seen. Uh, we're also in the middle, after that, of the longest drought ever. So we're seeing a lot of global change uh, tied to that. Uh, paradoxically, it'll go back and forth between, we can go back one. Okay, this is, uh, back then. Okay, this is our Bega, and actually the cycle of flooding and disturbance deposits a lot of soil on us. You can see in the previous picture, which we don't have to go back to, there's a lot of nutrients getting washed out. Uh, so, uh, but what, that is a benefit to us because we're accumulating soil, and this is our dry season garden. We are not the first people to be here. Uh, we live in an area that was densely populated during the, the uh, uh, Maya classic period. We're close to Lubantu and Maya site. Um, and so we can learn a lot of things from them. They made uh, all the right decisions for a while until they made the wrong decisions. Um, we don't have a lot of time to go into that, uh, but we're going to talk about what are degraded lands. Uh, the, all of the developing world suffers from a lot of degraded lands. Much of this is tied to population density. Some of it is tied to uh, politics and economics. Um, so to define them, we're looking at things like former pe uh, cattle pasture, where the land has not been fallowed or not been rot rotated. Former citrus groves, we have a lot of that in Belize. Uh, former banana plantations, overworked milpa, slash and burn, that has not been fallowed. We need a 12-year uh, fallow cycle to repair those soils. Uh, export land, fire damaged landscapes, and ex we see accelerated poverty tied to soil depletion. Because as soil gets depleted, people start to make more advances into the forest to grow things. Uh, where are we now? I, I, 
population density is directly tied to soil depletion. And so I'm just going to go through the numbers very quickly. But in 1985, when I arrived in Belize at age 19, the population was 150,000 people. Uh, in 2014, we had 330,000 people. Uh, in Guatemala's population, the same period went from 6 million people to 14 million people. The adjacent department of Guatemala, the Paten, in 1985 have had a population of 150,000 people, uh, but after the peace accord was signed in 1996, the displaced refugees that couldn't come back to their land all moved to the Paten. Uh, there are now 2 million people there, and we're seeing complete collapse of soils. Uh, in a 30-year period, more or less, uh, in 1980, Belize had 74.4% forest cover. In 2010, we had 62.8% forest cover. In 2014, we had 60.3% forest cover. So not only are we getting more forest loss, the rate of loss is increasing, all tied to population density and bad agricultural practices. Um, this is just some depressing pictures of uh, two periods of 30 years apart uh, of uh, soil loss or forest cover loss. Um, now we're going to look at some of the enemies. Slash and burn is one of the problems that we have. Uh, I live in a Maya community. Uh, the, all the adjacent villages are Maya. They're either Kekshi Maya, where I live, San Pedro, Colombia, is the largest Kekshi Maya community outside of Guatemala. Uh, San Antonio is the largest Mopan Maya community outside of Guatemala. Slash and burn works really well. It's a perfect system as long as your population remains static. Uh, what we're seeing now is there are consequences of slash and burn. This is an escape fire. These are some farmers I was working with about 15 years ago in, in planting cacao. They are refugees from Honduras and El Salvador who settled in Belize in the 1980s. And in the 1990s, I was working with them to get them to grow cacao. There was a milpa fire that escaped about two miles away. It churned through the forest for about a week, and then it just killed all their cacao. It was one of the saddest things that ever I ever saw. Uh, this is a picture of a hillside uh, uh, that has been colonized by uh, illegal squatters from Guatemala who uh, are making very bad long-term decisions to meet short-term needs. They're cannibalizing or detracting from the future, stealing from the future to maintain the present. And they've cleared into land that is marginal for agriculture at best. Uh, certainly for grain agriculture, it is not suitable. They got probably one crop out of this. Uh, and after that, the soil is gone. When the soil is gone, you can't farm there anymore. All the um, ecosystem services that that provides are um, compromised. Uh, the hills across the road behind this uh, also suffered that. That was an escape fire that erased all the forest on the karst landforms. You can't farm on the karst landform, but the karst landform supports forest, which provides all the ecosystem services that we'll cover later. Uh, incidentally, Maya Mountain Research Farm installed the photovoltaic system on this school and built the uh, water system. I'll just mention that because energy poverty also ties into uh, soil poverty. So what we're looking at is how do we repair these things? And what we're looking for is to create a, a forest of food crops and timber crops and medicinal crops and marketable crops. And what we need to do is we need to use things that I call pioneer species. There's things that you get in and you put in and that will give you a yield within a year or two. But at the same time, they're providing services to the soil. So very quickly, uh, we're going to run through some of these. Uh, pineapple is a very useful food. Uh, it planted on contour, uh, it can help to control erosion. Pigeon pea, or Kajanus Kajan, very important food in India, um, is an excellent food source. It is also a, a uh, semi-perennial. It puts down a deep taproot, injecting the, the soil with a lot of carbon. It has mycorrhizal bacteria that help fix nitrogen. Um, uh, and at the end of its two, short two or three year lifespan, it actually makes very nice firewood, burns very quickly. Uh, lemongrass planted on contour or vetiver also helps to control erosion. And things like cassava break up the soil. Chaya is a, a, a fast, uh, is a semi-perennial leaf plant, very important. Uh, there is papaya also helps to break soil and colonize it. And cowpea, which can be used as a uh, leguminous cover crop. This is, of course, a highly abbreviated uh, thing, uh, list, excuse me. Um, 
2004, when we started Maya Mountain Research Farm, I'd been living on the land for many years, and I wanted to start a project. I had managed the Toledo cacao growers on behalf of a UK-based company called Green and Blacks that makes very good chocolate. Um, and what we found is that the best way to convey information to farmers whose literacy levels are, are small, or low rather, excuse me, and, and, the, uh, and they're in terms of reading and writing, but their visual, uh, their literacy is highly visual, was through actually site visits. And so we set, I set up Maya Mountain Research Farm as a venue to provide training for farmers so that they could come and see best practices. Um, so we're gonna look at some changes. In 2006, when we got some funding for what we call the classroom, this was the view down the window, out the window. That's the same view in 2013 from up on the roof above that window. And from that window again, this is the view in 2015. Uh, this is a piece of land that got damaged in a fire in 2008. Thank you. <laughs> uh, this is a fire that got damaged in 2000, a piece of land that got damaged by a fire in 2008. Uh, in 2013, we colonized and we pushed the, the bush back to reduce the fire risk, goes through our structures, and we're putting in some pineapple. This is what it looked like later in the year with some bananas. This is what it looked like later in the year with some more bananas. This is what it like, looked like a year later. And this was what it looked like two years later. Um, we are already getting pineapple out of here. We're getting banana out of here. And both the pineapple is retaining soil and the bananas are um, helping to break up the soil. Banana doesn't change the, the, the chemistry of the soil, but it does improve the structure. Um, and then there's ginger planted in there and a bunch of other species that will be our eventual food for us. Uh, this is also land that got damaged by this fire in 2008 that escaped from a neighbor about a mile away. Um, and this is what that landscape looked like in 2010. In 2006, uh, this, the building on the left is something we call the posh pods, where we put uh, the big times, there's a two-floor condominium, it's not really, and then uh, some bedrooms downstairs, and then there's a building called the dorm. Uh, this is what it looked like in 2013. Oh, excuse me, wait, I'm done. Wait, I went too far. Um, I'm going to, okay. Thank you. 2008, this is what it looked like after the fire around a building called the classroom. Uh, we nearly lost that building in fire. Uh, we used vetiver grass planted on contour, uh, then also pineapples and bananas and other things. That's when we planted out the vetiver grass using an A-frame level. Uh, in 2014, you can't see the, the, the classroom, but it's behind all those trees. Uh, oops, wait, we're going the other way, sorry. Um, this is also another view of around the classroom in 2014 where we planted a lot of Inga edulis uh, to both put the fire risk back and to provide us Inga seed for Inga alley cropping. We're not the first people to live here and one of the things in the area north of us in the Maya Mountains, there's many, many thousands of acres of terraces uh, in, in a place called the Cheeky Bull. It's very famous for it. So uh, this is actually on the other side of the Maya Mountains in the Bladen watershed and they, they're agricultural terraces that are mechanical barriers to retain soil, uh, which allowed, along with probably agroforestry and a bunch of other uh, things, them to get extremely high population densities uh, and to achieve enough surplus to float religious, trade, soldiers, artisans, paper makers, all the things that make up a great tradition. Um, so we do a little terracing too as well. Our terraces are not as big. Uh, uh, and then we use things like the Mascarenus mulching method. Does anybody in this room know Kevin Mascarenus? Okay, Kevin Mascarenus is one of my students. Actually, he, he was working on his permaculture diploma and he came and interned with us for a couple months to build a piggery, which we will see some of the pigs in a minute. And while we were had downtime, while we couldn't work on the actual piggery, he started making these contraptions that I ended up calling the Ma Mascarenus mulching method and they are basically comprised of biomass in open V facing up the slope uh, and then you fill biomass in it. So we use a lot of banana stems because the byproduct of harvesting. Um, it acts as a silt trap and so as the water washes silt in the, the network of plant material and biomass there slows it down and it increases fungal activity around the, the root zone of the target species. In this case uh, it is a breadnut tree, or Artocarpus comansi. Um, using his technique and also biochar and compost that we've done in biochar, we had fruiting in three years. 
of cacao tree. These are, this is an ancient Maya cacao that we collected in the Upper Bladen watershed and uh, were helicopter evacuated by the British Army. So thank you, English taxpayers, for that. Uh, and the original trees that we got out of there uh, took seven years to bear. Using the biochar and compost, we were getting trees in three years, and also the mascarinus mulching method. Um, we like to value add this. This is Marina, who's also from England, uh, on our BC Makina grinding cacao. And this is Sheila making cacao balls. These are the cacaos that we collected out of Bladen. We have three different phenotypes of cacao that are very interesting. Um, but what we're looking at is repairing damaged land and creating the conditions that we can put cacao. So this is a view outside of our window. Uh, Selene and I, uh, we look outside in the morning and have our cup of coffee. This is what we see. All those trees that you can see there are on what was former cattle pasture. And underneath it is cacao. Uh, this is also former cacao, uh, former cattle pasture that is now a cacao dominated polyculture. Uh, this is also former citrus, which is also a polyculture with some cacao and a bunch of other things. Uh, but this is what we're trying to reach. This is a system that closely mimics the structure and the biological diversity of primary habitat. We're looking to recreate the rainforest using species that are largely human-centric. There are plants in, this, in here that fix nitrogen. There are plants that provide food. There are plants that provide fuel, plants that provide timber, uh, plants that provide marketables, and that's what we're wanting to do. Um, I don't have time to talk about corn, but corn is a big problem. Uh, Inga alley cropping is the solution. This is Inga trees uh, planted at uh, about a few months. This is what it looked like at about year two, at which point we coppice it and plant corn in between it. Uh, and then when we're done, we, it grows back again. This is, uh, I don't have a lot of time to go into this because we've got more stuff, but this is uh, something that was come up by a, a man named uh, Mike Hans, who does his work primarily in Honduras with something called the Inga Foundation. Um, I highly recommend anybody who's interested in this look, look it up because it offers a wonderful solution to the problem of growing annual crops in human tropics without destroying your soil. It also provides people who practice this with fuel wood because most people in lowland humid tropics cook with fuel wood, myself included, and you find zones around villages that are depleted of fuel wood because of the management practices and people have to go further and further afield to find that. So this is a very neat solution. Um, that this area here, five weeks later, it looked like this, and this was a nice French intern that was working with us, and it was taken by a uh, Quebecois student named uh, Jonathan Pedno, who has done a lot of work with us in the last two years on Inga alley cropping. He is another mad scientist uh, who I really like. One of the limitations to this uh, has been the problem that it takes an Inga tree a few years to produce seeds. So it takes four or five years before you get seeds. Jonathan has come up with a technique uh, doing micropropagation. If anybody's interested, I can talk about that later. Holy shit. Okay, so, uh, oh, um, I'm about, uh, um, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm gonna go fast. So these are sub canopy species that are important. Once we create the conditions, I'm gonna turn and pretend I don't see Maddie. Um, the, the, I know it won't work. Uh, all right, uh, these are the species that we want to put once our canopy is established. These are the things where we're value adding. Uh, this is ginger, wonderful subcanopy species. It does very well in agroforestry system. These are some of the products that we're trying to get out of here because we all need to obtain a yield. So food, fiber, fuel, timber, medicinals, marketable crops, and fodder for animals. Um, I'm going to burn up everything right here. The, the most important thing of this is the ecosystem services. So we're not only providing for ourselves, uh, we are repairing damaged soil. So some of the things that we're doing is we're building soil, uh, we're retaining soil, uh, we have, we're retaining soil moisture, uh, we're sequestering carbon, we're creating oxygen, we're mitigating floods, uh, we're creating biodiversity both within species and between species, very important. Uh, we're creating biological corridors that are very important. We're creating buffer zones between cultivated areas and protected areas and creating habitat. Uh, there's an animal, this uh, another animal. Again, this is what, uh, yes, this is what we're trying to, to create. We're trying to create something that's like the primary rainforest. And the way we do that is through uh, permaculture design courses. I just, there's one more slide. 
we want to plan for succession. Uh, we use in, a, a biological indicator species, and we're replicating what's called WAMIL, which is regenerative forest. Um, we think about our spacing, which is both north, south, east, west, vertical, and temporal. Uh, we th planning for succession, planning for a canopy or subcanopy species. That's what we're aiming for. These are perennial crops. These are chickens. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. I told you he was wonderful. Right. This thank man you. is creating rainforests for us to eat. Okay. Woo! -hoo! So. Um, we have time for a few questions, which he's going to answer really briefly. <laughs> okay. Yes, Antonella. How can we help you in your How can we help you in your mission? Oh, great oh okay. Thank you. Uh, there's something everybody here should plant a tree. If you don't live in an area that you can plant a tree, find an organization that does. There are a lot of wonderful organizations in the world, including Maya Mountain Research Farm, that do a lot of valuable work on a very small budget. And so if you can find an organization to support, I heartily encourage you to do that. I will mention that Maya Mountain Research Farm is a pretty good organization. And uh, so I have to go all the way to the very last slide because, nope, nope, just, just to the thank you one. It's got my, my, my phone number, my email, uh, and my Facebook Brilliant. page, and uh, any other qu yes, questions? More questions. Yay. Okay. Thank you very much. So you're gobsmacked. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what I'll do then. I'm going to let Christopher have a rest for a minute and open the questions to the panel. So if you guys could grab the mic. Um, does anyone have a question that they would like to address to the panel in the last five minutes of our session? Ooh. Oh, sorry. Kind of relax then. Yes, please. Um, we've got a field which is on a moorland, a high moorland in the Pennines, and it was cattle pasture is now, I'm putting it to a traditional hay meadow, but it's got a lot of reeds growing on it. How do I get rid of the reeds? It's about 10 acres. W why do you want to get rid of the weeds? Reeds. Oh, reeds? Yeah. Oh, well, it's an indication the soil is wet and acid, mm. and therefore you, you, you need to open it up. What's the underlying geology? What rock Grit, is it on? Gritstone. I, Gritstone. I, know the, I know the real answer is drainage. That's an expensive answer. Um, yeah, um, moles are quite good at providing free field they're drains. And moles they're. need earthworms. So gentle liming, but if you keep sheep on it, then you need to put mineral licks to restore the minerals that are tied up by the liming. And that will <clears throat> start to open the soil up. Um, the other thing you can do is rip it uh, with a mm. plough um, just to create uh, drains. As much as you would do key lining, uh, but it depends how shallow the soil is as to whether you can actually do that or there's not. A, there's a reasonable depth, but moles don't like wet ground either, so... No, but if you rip it with a, <laughs> with a mole it. plough, then it creates drainage and it will create better conditions and introduce earthworms and lime. Thank you, Graham. Any other questions, please? Yes, please. please. How do you use the biochar? Uh -huh. oh, okay, Bi biochar, I work a lot... One of the people I work with is Albert Bates, who wrote a book called The Biochar Solution, which explains a lot about biochar. I was initially a skeptic, uh, and then I was reading about biochar, and it started to make sense. Biochar is maximizing edge. One gram of charcoal spread into one flat surface with two sides ha covers enough space to cover a basketball court. That's all habitat for bacteria and fungi and other small microorganisms. So what, if we were to add that directly to soil, you would see an immediate loss of soil biota that would move in to colonize that space. So what we like to do is we mix it with our, our, our uh, compost. And one of the things we, we do is, unfortunately, I had got about 50% through the thing, uh, sadly, but we like to cook. We have a biochar stove. We used to cook our pig food, some of the, the hard nuts that we have, and then we feed that to the pigs. 
the biochar we put in their bedding, which they help break it up and, and make it smaller. And then we put that in the compost and then we apply it. That is one of the reasons that our cacao trees are bearing in three years. So I, w I was initially a skeptic about biochar. I am a huge believer in it because the one year that we did trials, we did uh, like 100 cacao trees with it that are now bearing in, in less than three years and, and three years. And we did 20 control trees. We got hit by a, a very, very pronounced snap of dry in the rainy season. All 20 of those trees died, the ones that controls with no biochar, and all the other ones survived. So, yeah, so that's how we use it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, there's a gentleman up there for a bit of exercise. Meet halfway. Thank you. How do you quantify the sequestration of carbon so you could use it for carbon offsetting in your soils, if possible? Uh, I mean, there, there are many different ways to measure carbon in the soil, and this is one of the joys of soil lab testing. There's a hundred different techniques and methodologies, and they all have different interpretations and numbers. It's quite a minefield. So, um, however, uh, one of the important things is, is consistency. It's not necessarily our soil test number in itself. It's the that number over time. Trends and patterns over time is what becomes much more important than an individual number. Um, that there are, there's a lot of discussion around that, I guess, that question regarding what is the, it, should there be a universal methodology for testing carbon for this purpose? And the, the answer is not agreed upon. Uh, there are lots of different ways. Um, uh, and of course, then there's the other question of, of course, there's a lot of interest in carbon offsetting and, and farmers getting paid to build uh, carbon in the soil. This is of great interest, there's a, a, particularly in Australia, this is really moving forward. But again, there's just still so much debate about how you actually, kind of some of the nuts and bolts of how you do that. Um, so uh, yes, it hopefully is coming, uh, but exactly how and when is still in the making, I would say. Okay, um, just compassionate to our tummies now. Um, so I'm going to pull this to a close. We could keep these guys answering questions all afternoon. They've been brilliant. Maddie, can I just get a quick plug in for the <laughs> Permaculture Research Digest? Lots of these questions that are being asked, there will be some yes. relic article parked on the Permaculture yeah. Research Digest. Um, so get on there and search it and stuff like soil yeah. carbon. We've got a lot of stuff so, and, and you can get it. So. And I've been asked also to uh, give a little plug for another not-for-profit project called Soil Hack. If you put Soil Hack into your browser, um, you will find useful resources, uh, plans for webinars, affordable real-life events, a collaborative process. You're all invited. invited. <laughs> it's the Irish in me. Um, to get involved. Um, so... Please put your hands together to thank these four gentlemen for their fantastic presentations today and their work in the world.